Welcome to Engage, leading conversations that matter. Join in the conversation. Send an email to engage at cfpublic.org. Send a recorded talkback message on the free Central Florida Public Media app. Leave a voicemail by calling 407-273-2300, extension 246. Engage is made possible with the support of listeners like you. You're listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. I'm Sharon Stone. Coming up, the investment the founders of Orlando's Major League Pickleball team are making in the sport here and a resource to erase the shame around miscarriage and help children comprehend the loss. First, though, public safety in Central Florida. Retired police chief Rick Myers was Sanford's interim chief in the immediate aftermath of Trayvon Martin's death. He was a 17-year-old shot and killed by George Zimmerman in 2012. Well, today, Rick Myers is part of this new group that launched just last week. It's organized and funded by former chiefs of police and sheriffs who say they're fed up with inaction in Washington. Their national nonpartisan group will advocate for policy changes by inserting the voices of police into public discourse. Myers says he wants to improve policing by growing and reforming the profession. One policy he is advocating for is a national database of officers who have been fired for egregious acts. Myers joined Engage to explain how this group effort is different than others that have been tried before. One of their primary focuses is gun violence. So I started their conversation by asking Myers what changed for him once he took over as Sanford's police chief after the shooting death of Trayvon Martin. When city manager Bonaparte contacted and asked if I'd come down and help, said he needed my help, and we had developed a a very good working rapport throughout the screening and interview process, I just felt an obligation to come help him. And yet I started getting bombarded with calls from friends saying, don't go there. What good can happen for your career, your resume, da, da, da. And I said, look, at this point in my career, I could care less about my resume. You know, I have the opportunity to try and go help a community that's gone through a tremendous crisis. And uh, you reach a point professionally where it's, it's not about achieving anything. It's about doing work that makes a difference. And that was probably the first time in my career, and I'd been a chief uh, a long time already by then, that I kind of had that approach or attitude about it. And uh, <laughs> Mr. Bonaparte said it would be three to five months, and I was there just shy of a year. And it was, for me, a highlight because I got to work with great people, uh, both within the agency, but just as importantly, out in the community, and hopefully played a small part in helping the community move on from the pain and the... uh, really years and years of institutional racism that we were able to get the ball rolling towards a healthier community, a healthier relationship between its city government and the underrepresented or disenfranchised in the community. So it was a great experience for me. I learned a ton. Any lessons you can share that you are now taking into this new national advocacy group that you are part of? Well, I think a large one uh, that I, and this is not a lesson necessarily I learned in Sanford, but it really affirmed it, is uh, the critical importance of transparency. And that's really a big feature for police leaders for community safety. We plan on being very transparent on our positions. We're hoping to really inform and help Congress make good and better decisions on issues of importance and community safety across the country. And 
I think too many people are uh, afraid of opposing voices or special influences, and they don't want to speak out against that. But in Sanford, there were a lot of people who were not afraid to speak out on their perceptions of what was broken and what needed fixing. And I enjoyed working with those folks. I heard them loud and clear, and it definitely guided and informed my decision making on helping to aim the agency in the right direction, if you will. So I think that was a great lesson that really applied then, and it applies now in this effort we're doing. And the effort you're talking about, it was organized and funded by former chiefs of police and sheriffs. What made you want to invest your time, your money, into this effort? Well, for too long, police leaders have not had a voice on Congress, on the Hill. There are folks who do a great job of representing rank and file and, and getting their voice heard. And thankfully, on a lot of occasions, it's helped Congress make good decisions. But there are times, not that common, but there are times when rank and file may be looking through a little narrower window than leaders do who have to look at the big picture. And no one's been there to represent the leadership. So our chair, who's been a, a good friend for many, many years, approached me a couple of years ago and said, can you help me create this new organization to get the voice of police leaders in front of Congress influencing public policy and legislation all towards the goal for the greater good, making our communities safer. So that's how I personally got involved. And uh, over that two year time, pretty much everyone we've called has supported what we're doing. Everyone understands that for years, the voice and concerns of law enforcement leaders have been muted on the Hill, and we're trying to fix that. What message do you want Congress to hear from you, or what policies do you want to impact? It's a great question. We have three broad themes that we're talking about. The first is improving policing, raising the bar on policing. We are not blind to the fact that we still are in need of reform and growth as a profession. There currently is no enforced or mandated method for police agencies and sheriff's offices to report to a national database police certified officers who have been fired for egregious acts. And we think there needs to be a national database to avoid this rogue cop shopping for another job or hopping from agency to agency. Our second big theme is protecting and preserving our great democratic practices in this country. Every single person should be able to go to the polls without fear of intimidation, without risk, and cast a vote for whoever they believe in. And they should feel safe doing that. We also think they should feel really safe in knowing no one's going to tamper with that vote. That ballot is sacred, and it needs to be secure and processed as such. Our third broad theme has to do with uh, guns and gun violence. Some of the polls have shown that upwards of 80, 90 percent of Americans, including gun owners, believe in a universal background check that um, will keep guns out of the hands of people who will either do themselves harm or do others harm. 
There are loopholes currently that people don't have to be background checked to acquire a gun. And everyone across the country, not everyone, but most everyone across the country believes that's pretty ludicrous that, you know, you can find this narrow loophole or that narrow loophole and not have to have a background check. I've been in law enforcement now 47 years. If I try and go buy a gun, I should be checked because, you know, what makes me special over anybody else? If I want to buy from a relative, I should be checked. It doesn't make sense that we're not doing this now. Secondly, ghost guns are those that either are assembled from a series of parts that one can order over the internet. Sometimes they are entire weapons that are illegally imported by foreign manufacturers. The point is they're all untraceable. There are no serial numbers. ATF can't trace them. Your local police can't trace them. We think Congress needs to act swiftly to make illegal the production, importation, and possession of ghost guns. And finally, we're one of the few professions that has to raise our hand and take an oath to preserve and protect the Constitution of the United States. That includes all its amendments. We are pro-Second Amendment. However, we also recognize, and the Supreme Court has upheld, that over the course of history of this country, certain weapons become identified that are so lethal and are designed for one thing only, and that's to shoot and injure or kill as many people as possible in a short time frame, the federal government can restrict those. We're talking to retired police chief Rick Myers. How can you take a nonpartisan approach in such a divided time over something as politicized as gun violence, gun control? Well, we don't believe gun violence should be a political issue. I mean, why would it be a political issue that a mother jumped in front of bullets to protect her children, and yet her eight-year-old son got shot in the head in Michigan last weekend? What's political about that as an issue? When the shooter had known mental health issues, Michigan has a new red, a newer red flag law that obligates, morally at least, maybe not legally, obligates family members, friends, and local police into making sure that person doesn't have a gun in his hand. And when the officers got to his residence after he committed suicide, they found an AR-15 style weapon, fully loaded, ready to go. What did he intend to do next? We'll never know that. Uh, what's political about that? That people are dying. I, I, so the very premise of your question, I reject. That's how we can be nonpartisan. There's nothing political about this. How much momentum are you finding in Florida for this new group? Well, we just had our public launch, uh, what, two, three weeks ago. Uh, already we've commented on the bump stock ruling by the Supreme Court, and we saw what Congress did with that, nothing. And we commented just this week on a great ruling by the Supreme Court that, again, continues to restrict access to guns by people who have been convicted of domestic violence. It's a federal law, meaning states can't pick and choose what they're going to enforce. And believe me, that law is somewhat unpopular to some officers because, as sad as it may be, we hire from the human race to become police officers. So there are a handful of officers around the country who have been convicted of domestic violence. 
And guess what? That's the end of their career because they can't have a gun. How can you be a cop in this country if you can't have a gun? What is the takeaway for you, for our audience, about this new group and what you're trying to do? Police Leaders for Community Safety is trying to fill a niche that has gone unfilled for too many years. There are some outstanding police leadership groups across the country. They do share perspective with Congress. The one thing they can't do, which we can because we are a 501c4, meaning not only can we lobby, we can endorse candidates. We will shortly be sending out surveys to federal candidates for office to see if they are in alignment with our three key issues for this election cycle. And if they are, we're going to acknowledge and support that. If they are firmly opposed, we're going to acknowledge and make that very clear as well, that they are against our, what we believe are reasonable, fair, nonpartisan strategies to make it safer in your neighborhood. We are out here fighting for everyone who lives, works, and visits the USA. We are nonpartisan. We represent everyone. We don't care. I don't even know what party, if any, the other members of the board are or any of our uh, more than 50 distinguished leaders who are our advisory board. And that number is growing. We've been out on the front lines and leading the men and women who every day are on the front lines protecting and serving you. And uh, we're going to keep trying to guide and influence some of the huge public policy decisions that Congress up to date has been unable to act on. Retired police chief Rick Myers served as Sanford's interim chief in the aftermath of the Trayvon Martin homicide. There's more ahead here on Engage. A growing passion for pickleball has the owners of Orlando's major league team investing in the sport in Central Florida. If you miss any part of our show today, you can always subscribe to the Engage podcast and listen whenever it's convenient for you. This program will be available on demand at cfpublic.org. This is Engage on Central Florida Public Media. Listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. I'm Sharon Stone. Ahead on this program, research from the National Institutes of Health indicates nearly 15% of pregnancies end in miscarriage. And for many women, talking about the experience is difficult. I looked for a resource to help explain to my children who at that time were three and one, what what had happened, especially the three-year-old, who was very curious and, and very attuned uh, to things. And there just was nothing out there. We will talk with the author of a children's book that addresses the painful topic of talking about a miscarriage. First, though, pickleball is soaring in popularity. The sport combines ping pong, tennis, and badminton into one game played with a paddle on a court. The Orlando Squeeze is the City Beautiful's major league team founded by the DeVos family. We're learning more about their expansion and investment in the community from Orlando Business Journal staff writer Ryan Lynch. He joined Engage earlier today to break down the explosion of pickleball and what he's learned about the DeVos family plans for a future facility. The very same, the ones that uh, you think of when you think of the magic and some other sports investments in Orlando. That That's the uh, family that we're talking about. Do they have any connection to pickleball? 
Sure. Um, the DeVosses own the Orlando Squeeze of Major League Pickleball, which have been competing in that league for a little bit now. And uh, that that's their primary connection to the sport. Ryan in the past has talked about, you know, playing with his family and that that's kind of how he initially got into the game. I think a lot of people, myself included, would be surprised to learn Orlando has a Major League Pickleball team or maybe even that there is a Major League Pickleball League. Is Orlando being positioned as some kind of center of the pickleball world? I think uh, Florida itself has been growing as a pickleball community. I think when you think of the sport, you think of a lot of the you know elderly folks in the villages playing it, but it's it's really grown into a game where a lot of you know working class professionals, younger people are even gravitating towards it. And, uh, several companies have proposed different indoor and outdoor pickleball concepts to kind of uh, capitalize on that growing passion for the game. Obviously, you know the Soto one being one of the more high profile ones, but there's a number of different folks uh, from uh, Rob Gronkowski to others who have invested in these types of concepts that are looking to kind of scale up as the participation in the sport grows. And we, we've even seen uh, cities and counties in Central Florida start to add these uh, type of courts to the public uh, to kind of have for free use, uh, whether it's replacing tennis courts or adding them in addition to them. So uh, kind of a lot of growth on that side of the game, especially they saw a lot of growth during uh, COVID-19 when a lot of people were looking for outdoor activities to play and, and sort of do in a safe way. Are these ventures proving to be profitable? I think uh, for a lot of the concepts, just by the amount of growth that we've seen uh, are starting to prove. Some of them are starting to scale up and still looking for that profitability. But, you know, for some of the newer ones, it probably remains to be seen. But I think, you know, if you look at the investment within the sport, the money is definitely there for people to kind of gain and, and be able to have a successful venture from. In Orlando, we've sort of seen the public concepts kind of come out first. You know, you think of the city of Orlando adding courts as one example, but uh, some of these private courts are really starting to scale up. We're seeing them from everywhere, from Osceola County, Orange County, uh, Seminole County, kind of, you know, going through the, the planning documents, just seeing 10, 15, 20 court type concepts coming to fruition or just being proposed. So uh, for, for some of the local ones, I definitely think there's some room to run just in terms of meeting that demand for players. Can you tell us more about the projects being slated? You mentioned the one connected to the DeVos family, Soto, south of downtown Orlando. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so that one's actually, if you're familiar with it, it's going to be right across the street from the uh, the Target that's located right there. And um, th they're basically going to have uh, seven courts there. They're going to have some elevated dining concepts. They're going to offer coffee. They're going to offer cocktails. But in addition to that, they're hoping uh, to offer you know merch for the squeeze as well as some opportunities to have lessons, whether that's uh, from some of the pros there. And they're looking to have it on a variety of schools skill levels. So whether you're, you know, pickleball 101, let's say, or you're somebody who's a more experienced player, I think their goal is to really kind of offer sort of a wide range of activities. Uh, they, they also mentioned the potential to offer, you know, corporate uh, type events, you know, like a team building and those sort of things, as well as they'll have a private event space as well. So uh, I'm sure that kind of meets a wide range of the sort of users you might see gravitating towards such a concept at any given time. And it, it's going to be a membership concept, but it's not going to be only memberships. Uh, members of the public will also be able to use this. So they're, they're kind of offering a wide array of ways that people can access this. After listening to you describe, I guess, kind of the amenities involved with it, we've seen that confluence of golf and entertainment, like Top Golf and Pop Stroke. Are we seeing that with pickleball as well? Yeah, I think um, may maybe not in the exact same ways, but we're starting to see, you know, some of these other concepts kind of blend that, you know, dining and entertainment. You know, I think some of the other sports we've seen it with are like um, baseball. You know, you, you look at, I think there's a concept in Texas where, you know, you're kind of holding a bat and the ball comes up and you hit it towards the screen and it shows you and it offers kind of a different sort of engagement and a way that, you know, maybe me and you are not 
not playing at Yankee Stadium or something, but we could still, you know, have a bat in hand and still have a good time with the sport. So I think I think we're really starting to see that, you know, on the pickleball side, maybe more with incorporating, oh, like a dining or a bar type concept into a, you know, sort of setting where it might not usually be there. You know, you might just be going to a park and it's like, oh, you know, we play the sport and then, you know, maybe go somewhere for a bite to eat or a drink. Whereas, you know, now we're kind of having that all in one place. So it's like, oh, I just finished my game and look, the food's here, or our, our drinks are here. So I, I think it offers sort of a different feel for people trying to like, oh, maybe I'm exploring the sport like uh, top golf. Like I've, I've never swung a golf club before, but this is like a low risk low key environment where you know I don't necessarily have to feel embarrassed that or be embarrassed by like higher skilled players it, it's sort of an entry level anything else that we should know about this rise of pickleball in central florida uh, i mean i i don't think it's uh, destined to stop uh, obviously florida is a growing place in terms of population so i think uh, most pockets of the state where you're seeing growth, uh, I'd imagine these concepts would still, you know, do well and potentially be a draw. So I, I think, you know, there's definitely room to run. And then just on the professional side, a, a lot of these leagues are, it, it's sort of unique in terms of they're, they're like a tour, kind of like the PGA tour where you're going to a location versus, you know, being like the magic where you have home games, but I know Orlando is sort of slated to host a um, a round of the uh, Major League Pickleball playoffs during their upcoming season. And it's going to be at the USTA facility. So I think that's sort of a, a unique element of it where they're kind of drawing the these additional aspects of like we both have the sort of casual side of things where, you know, users can come in and play this. And then we also have the professional side where, you know, spectators can come and actually watch the highest level professionals in this league uh, play, which, which, you know, I, I don't know about you. I, I haven't watched too much, you know, professional pickleball minus TV. So it <laughs> kind of provides, I guess, a unique viewing experience where you're like, oh, maybe I watched tennis before, but I've never seen something like this. Ryan Lynch is a staff writer with Orlando Business Journal. This is Engage on Central Florida Public Media. There is so much shame when it comes to the topic of miscarriage. Too often women blame themselves when they shouldn't and they grieve in silence. Most losses happen during the first trimester before people even really start to talk to others about their pregnancy. So you may not even realize just how common it is because it's not talked about. According to the Mayo Clinic, up to 20% of known pregnancies end in miscarriage, and the actual number is likely higher because they happen so early. Dr. Corey Bale is a UCF College of Medicine professor and OBGYN. The mother of two wrote the book, Why is Mommy Crying? Explaining Early Pregnancy Loss to Young Children. This book has become a resource for grief organizations like the Miscarriage Association. Dr. Bale joined Engage to talk about why she wrote this book and what can be done to get rid of the shame associated with this topic. She begins by sharing her experience with miscarriage. I was in my very last year of residency when I became pregnant for the first time. And that pregnancy, thank, thank God, was uh, uncomplicated, though we did we did struggle a bit with, you know, how much prenatal testing we were going to do and that kind of stuff. But it was a, a healthy pregnancy, and we, we decided we had lots of resources, and we weren't going to do testing. Whatever happened, happened, and, and we would be prepared to be parents for that child. And we had a, a marvelously healthy son who, who just, we just had our first grandchild, so it, it's been, um, uh, that all went very well. And then a um, uh, a couple years later, I, I delivered my daughter, also healthy, wonderful. She's uh, finishing a infectious disease fellowship in Texas, so she's she's doing well. Also, both kids are married. You know, we love their partners. Things are good. And then I got pregnant a third time, and we we always thought we we wanted you know at least three kids, and um, I miscarried. And I think like a lot of uh, people, even though I was an OBGYN, I was unprepared for that. We had decided, as do I think a lot of people, not to tell 
anybody that we were pregnant until we had gotten out of that first trimester, since, you know, if, if things are going to happen, they tend to happen in the first trimester. And um, it, it was a very, very lonely experience. And and I I looked for a resource to help explain to my children who at that time were three and one what what had happened, especially the three year old who was very curious and and very attuned uh, to things, and there just was nothing out there. And uh, um, when we reached out to our synagogue to our rabbi. There, there was no ritual because, of course, historically, you know, and, and religion hasn't caught up to this, but historically people, you know, women had 10, 12, 15 pregnancies, you know, prior to like the industrial age. And it was not uncommon to have three or four miscarriages. I know just from talking to <laughs> my friends, it's it happens so much more frequently than we talk about. How common is early pregnancy loss or miscarriage? The, you're, you're right that there's a, a sadly a great deal of silence and and women you know blaming themselves and and un, you know uh, uh, I think that silence breeds this thing of of the the guilt that people feel about a pregnancy loss. In terms of how common it is, that's a really interesting question. There's not one answer because it depends on how you count. If in studies that have been done where women were trying to conceive and pregnancy tests were being done and you knew exactly when somebody conceived, then the number is probably about 25% of pregnancies, about a fourth of pregnancies end up not continuing. But many of those happen before women maybe have even gotten to their first misperiod. Or maybe they think, oh, my period's a little late or a little funny this month, and they, they miscarry and have a withdrawal bleed at six weeks or even at eight weeks and have never done a pregnancy test. So the acknowledged number also depends if you just look at the first trimester and you say, okay, well, how often does it happen if we average everything together up, up through 12 weeks? And I think ACOG quotes something around one in five to one in six first trimester pregnancies, but I think that that number can really vary depending what literature you look at, depending how they count it. And of course, if somebody's trying to conceive, they often do know if they're pregnant before the first menstrual period. And then for that pregnancy not to continue can be just as devastating as a full-term loss. We're able to, well, we're currently still able to use contraception and have some, you know, reproductive decision-making. And the average family size is somewhere around two children per family. And so each pregnancy, as a result, is so much more precious. And an early pregnancy loss is not the same now as it was, you know, when people were having much larger families, I think. You said in your case it was a really lonely experience. And we just talked about how many women actually go through it as well. Why is there such shame around it? Well, I think we as women tend to blame ourselves when things don't go well in our family. And and I think there's this tendency to think, you know, was I not doing the right things? Did I not eat the right things? Did I work too hard? Was I too stressed? Did I not take care of this pregnancy? And I think that that's sort of the knee-jerk reaction. And again, I think that people are very private about pregnancy because of the possibility of miscarriage. But yet when it happens, they haven't discussed it with their extended families and friends. And so then they feel very alone. And it's hard to take time off from work for this. We have no ritual in, in our society for acknowledging an early pregnancy loss. I mean, in my case, they said, oh, the, the closest we can get for you, we can call you to the Bema, you know, in the sanctuary. We can call you up and we can do the blessing of having survived a difficult voyage or a difficult journey. And they said, like, like you know, you survived a shipwreck or, or some kind of something of a physical journey rather than a, than a journey uh, in the more, you know, uh, non-literal sense. 
And I was shocked. I mean, I was like, you know, well, isn't there anything that acknowledges a, a, a miscarriage or a pregnancy loss? And they said, no, not really. You know, religion hasn't hasn't caught up to that reality that, you know, people are having fewer and fewer pregnancies. I mean, things may have changed now. This was 30 plus years ago. but I assume that this is something you deal with with your patients frequently as well. I really wanted a resource to explain things to my children, you know, to my daughter when she became old enough, but to my son then at three, and there just was nothing available. And certainly I tell patients that there's no shame and that this is very common. And indeed, having one miscarriage, it's such a frequent occurrence that, that there's no special medical workup or evaluation because chances are, even after two miscarriages, that, that you can expect to have a full-term successful pregnancy. The odds are with you, very much so. And I'm very reassuring to patients who have gone through this. And I also tell them that, you know, it... it, it as much as your friends and family want to be consoling because there really is so little public acknowledgement of this as a significant event in the life of a young woman, that they may say things that, that are hurtful and a, a little selective deafness will help, that, that, that it's, it's better to hear them saying that they're sorry and they know it's a very difficult time and that they have lots of hope for the future instead of, of hearing them say things like, oh, it was meant to be, or this was God's will, or some of the other things that are said that in the moment can be very hurtful, that minimize the pain. When you were dealing with your own personal loss, did you feel like you had to be at least outwardly strong for your kids? I mean, I think we always feel that we have, as mothers, we have to be um, strong for our children. But I, I wanted them to understand what was going on. I mean, I think, <laughs> I think sometimes as uh, the child of physicians, they um, maybe get TMI, you know, too much information about things. But I, I wanted to be able to explain it to them in a way that they would understand, not a medical explanation, but a an explanation that would reassure them and yet explain to them why I was sad or, and, and why their dad was sad. The book you wrote is called Why Is Mommy Crying? Explaining Early Pregnancy Loss to Young Children. How has it been received? Oh, I've been really delighted with its reception, especially among organizations that I've had such respect for over the years, such as Compassionate Friends and the Star Legacy Foundation, both which have broader missions of loss, but who do have some resources for women who have had a miscarriage. And then there's also the Miscarriage Association and there have been other groups that have uh, really responded well to the book, it's, and it's listed on many sites as a resource now, and, and that's just been really wonderful. I'm looking through the book now, and one page it says, sometimes a baby returns to be with God. We know belief in God isn't universal, but you were telling me that was a specific choice. Why write it in this way? Well, I really wanted to set out to write a book that was reassuring to a child from a child's point of view. And I think that even in families that don't identify specifically as being religious, when a loss occurs, many people around them are going to say things like, this was God's will, this was meant to be uh, around a miscarriage or a child loss. You often hear, oh, they're an angel now, or the baby's in heaven or really any loss, not just a baby, but that that person's with God, that person's in heaven. And I, and I thought, well, from a child's point of view, they're going to hear this type of language. And so it was a conscious decision to use that as a way of comforting the child, because I think that that is common language. And even for families where this is not a belief, 
they can certainly substitute the word God when because it's meant to be a, a picture book to a read aloud story. They certainly can substitute that for spirit or any comforting word that they want to use. And it's certainly intended to be completely non-denominational. You don't see pictures of pearly gates. You don't see any particular religious figure identified. There's no crosses. There's no yarmulkes. There's no crescents. You know, this is meant to be as universal as possible and comfort as many children as possible. What would you like our audience to take away from our conversation? Well, I want the audience to know that there is a resource out there. If you know someone who has experienced a miscarriage, who is sad, um, who wants to explain things to children in their family, especially to reassure the child and the family that their parent's going to be okay, that there is a resource out there that can start that conversation. And I hope that they can find their way to it. OBGYN Corey Vale is a professor at the UCF College of Medicine and author of the book, Why is Mommy Crying? Explaining Early Pregnancy Loss to Young Children. Dr. Vale is also a volunteer member of the Central Florida Public Media Community Advisory Board. Coming up, we visit a museum in Winter Park displaying photographic images of life at Bethune-Cookman in the 1940s. We want to hear from you. Let us know what you'd like to hear more about or what you're glad you heard. Send us an email to engage at cfpublic.org. You are listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. You're listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. Gordon Parks was born into a poor Kansas family, a farming family, back in 1912, the youngest of 15 siblings. He grew up in a deeply segregated society. On his own at 15, Gordon Parks found odd jobs in the brothels and beer halls around St. Paul, Minnesota. It was during this time that he began to read from the books and magazines lying around the flop houses he used to frequent. A periodical dedicated to photography grabbed his attention, and at the age of 28, Parks launched a career as one of the nation's leading chroniclers of American life via film. His subjects were typically black Americans, expository and unflinching in their daily routines. One series of photographs from Parks was taken at Bethune-Cookman University as much of the country was focused on World War II. The series, called Gordon Parks, The Power of Photography, is currently on display at Winter Park's Alvin Palaszczuk Museum and Sculpture Gardens. Engage stopped by to view the exhibit with curator Tammy Diener Lafferty. Gordon Parks worked for the Farm Security Administration in 1942. The Farm Security Administration, that was a Franklin Roosevelt program, an FDR program as part of the New Deal during like 1935 to 42 as part of the Great Depression and trying to get people back to work. And the Farm Security Administration also wanted to document what was going on in the country. They wanted everyone to see, you know, the, the plight of the farmers, the plight in the um, urban areas that people were really suffering. So they put together a team of photographers under Roy Stryker. And many of like the top documentary photographers of the time were on that team. One name you may recognize is Dorothea Lang. So Gordon Parks, as a self-taught photographer, you know, bought his first camera for the, in a pawn shop. He won um, the Julius Rosenwald Fellowship, and from there, he was selected to join the Farm Security Administration team of photographers. Shortly after he joined, we joined World War II, and the name was changed to the Office of War Information. But same group, same thing, just they shifted their focus to documenting war-related industries and that type of thing. So in 1943, uh, Parks was sent on assignment to Daytona Beach, which was then just a small southern town. And his assignment was to photograph Mary McLeod Bethune, the school she had founded, which became Bethune-Cookman University, as we know it today, and also the surrounding Daytona Beach neighborhood. Parks found himself on the university campus through a personal invitation from the school's namesake, who knew that for a black university to gain acceptance in American academia, the doors must be opened for all to see. 
Above there is the portrait of Mary McLeod Bethune. She really went out of her way. Wherever she saw needs, not only at her school, but in the community, she would take action and, and do what she could to help. One of the things she did was she, at the time, the hospital in Daytona Beach, they did not allow African Americans into the hospital, so she built a hospital for the black citizens. This photograph here of the um, Sunday morning chapel, I love there was a story I read about and a quote from her where, um, so during segregation, there was always like a whites only section and a colored section. And um, in her chapel, she didn't have that. So, and she would invite everyone from the community to come, including like, you know, prominent white people in the community to come to her chapel on Sunday mornings, and when they walked in, they would look around and be confused, where do I sit? And she would always just say, no sections here, just sit anywhere. Deaner Lafferty explained how easily Gordon Parks could slip into any setting to capture his subjects. They tell like a really wonderful story about Central Florida, and if you picture, you know, the difference between Daytona Beach today and then, this really documents and gives you a glimpse into, you know, a piece of history. This was a very different time. Segregation was very firmly in place. Gordon Parks had this wonderful ability to really break that barrier between photographer and subject. And you can just see from looking at the photographs how comfortable everyone is in the photographs. And he just really has a way, and these were very early in his career, so he developed and got better. But just the way that he has of um, you know, capturing the true essence of people and their emotion, I think is really powerful. Parks saw photography as more than a job, even more than art. Park saw that with his talent came a social responsibility. Early in his career, when he decided to become a photographer, what motivated him was he saw the power of photography, the power of a camera. And he grew up in poverty. He knew poverty well. And so he wanted to expose the evils of poverty and racism. And I think that's what you're seeing here, is he is, you know, he has taken that assignment on. While Park's photos did capture the painful reminders of segregated America, he was very cogent about recording the joy and belonging people found within black American communities. One of the things that I see in these photographs is like an amazing sense of like optimism and hope. And a lot of this was made possible by Mary McLeod Bethune, who was a remarkable woman. She's like one of the most influential women of her time. And she really believed in the power of education, empowering people through education and lifting people up. So she was able to expand her school, bring these students in, and educate them. And it may seem like there's a one photograph here which shows these are uh, like, you know, young women in a home economics class. And they're learning and their goals are to become, you know, like, you know, domestics, maids, things like that. And to us, that may not seem like a great aspiration. But at that time, you know, within like, you know, the realm of what was possible, that was a good aspiration. Tammy Diener Lafferty is curator at the Alvin Palaszczuk Museum and Sculpture Gardens. This exhibit is on display through August 18th. That's all for today's edition of Engage. We're back Thursday at 3. I'm Sharon Stone. Thanks for joining us. All Things Considered is coming up following NPR News. <laughs>